<laughs> and we are live. <laughs> Welcome to Sommelier's LP AMA. And it's a pleasure to have everyone here again. Uh, my name is Tarek, and I am with Sommelier and Volume 5. And I am uh, hosting today with uh, Zaki, and, and, and we are Sommelier.finance the co-processor for the Ethereum network, a uh, way to move your de assets into higher DeFi yields faster, as well as uh, pairings, our Uniswap V3 interface, and our upcoming sellers for automated Uniswap V3 management. Welcome. It's Wednesday, June 23rd, and the secret is out. We're here with uh, Tor from the Secret Network. And uh, what we're going to do today is talk all about uh, Secret. We're going to talk about Cosmos Chains. We're going to talk about Bridges. We're going to talk about DeFi on the Secret Network. So if you are a liquidity provider, Tor has brought us some Secret Alpha. So even if you don't get past minute number one on this entire stream, you do not want to miss out on the Secret Alpha. Get it? I, I just did that secret alpha that Tor is doing. We asked all our guests to bring some alpha, so he will. So I'm going to introduce everybody, and uh, let's kick it off. And of course, if you have any questions, uh, please do ask us uh, either on Twitter or uh, in Telegram. Uh, you can ask us in the Secret Network Telegram group, or you can ask us as well in the Sommelier Telegram Network group, or you can ask us on Twitter. Everywhere. We don't care. Ask us away. We'd be glad to give you secrets and great alpha. And with that, let me uh, welcome these two rock stars of both the Cosmos ecosystem and the secret ecosystem. Zaki Mannion from Sommelier. Welcome, Zaki. Uh, glad to be here. Awesome. And Tor Bear from the Secret Network. Glad, honored, and uh, delighted to be here. All right. Let's get rocking and rolling. OK, so let's go. Uh, it's uh, uh, are your bags still are your bags still OK, gentlemen? Uh, is everything all right? Uh, have you patched the leaks? Is the bleeding stopped? I mean, things are, are better you... this morning than they were uh, yesterday morning. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, I haven't been able to refresh my coin market cap since May. <laughs> Something's going on with my internet. So as far as I'm aware, everything's awesome. Why? What are you saying? <laughs> <That's good. laughs> that, that is, you know what? I like that attitude and I like that approach. Uh, so Tor, let's, let's kick it off. All right. So. Uh, Tell us, um, well, you know, what I want to know is uh, Secret is doing some awesome things. So will you share with us um, what Secret has done so far this year for liquidity providers? And, and when I say that, one of the coolest things that um, I jumped into uh, into Secret was some of the mining rewards that you guys had launched um, uh, for the Secret Bridge. So um, tell us, you know, Give us an, uh, give us a lowdown on 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 that and what has happened so far in the first half of the year before you give us alpha and um, let's talk about bridges. <laughs> yeah, for sure. So secret network at, at the very start. I mean, we're we're positioned uh, a little bit differently, I think, than a lot of the, like the liquidity uh, chains or like other L ones out there. The ones that are saying like, we're just going to be for like multi-chain liquidity, which has become a very hot narrative. Of course, Cosmos did it before it was cool. Um, so what brought us to the Cosmos ecosystem in the first place was the multi-chain vision. But for us, what we try to bring to that multi-chain ecosystem is primarily programmable privacy. So the ability to make some things public when needed, some things private when needed on the chain which doesn't exist by default in public blockchain ecosystems. That's not how blockchains were originally built to function, but it does really limit their capabilities. So where we're experimenting, not just in the DeFi space, but everywhere in the Web3 space is what can we build if we bring this aspect of programmable privacy? And one of the very first things that we launched was a bridge to the Ethereum ecosystem, knowing how much liquidity was in the Ethereum ecosystem, know how, knowing how much DeFi experimentation was native to the Ethereum ecosystem. So we constructed a bridge to Ethereum by which users could bring their ETH-based assets over to the secret ecosystem. And in the secret ecosystem, they became secret tokens. They are privacy preserving versions of themselves from the ETH ecosystem. And originally uh, we brought in LP interest and liquidity into our ecosystem via bridge mining. The idea yeah. was that you could provide single-sided liquidity on the bridge 
no yep. risk of impermanent loss. We just provide some short-term incentives for LPs to come over. Let's say you've got mm. some Ethereum lying around, you want some yield, lock it in the bridge. And what ended up happening was we were creating these anonymity pools across all of these different assets. So it was almost like what other projects might have called privacy mining or anonymity mining. For us, it was a prelude to a much more complex liquidity ecosystem. So the next thing to launch was Secret Swap. Secret Swap is a cross-chain, front-running, resistant DEX that we launched on Secret Network back in February. It went on mainnet. And at the time, it was only supporting ETH assets that were bridged over as secret tokens or any other secret tokens that were native to Secret Network, uh, even the secret token version of SCRT itself, which is the native coin of the network. And you could start trading, you could start LPing, but we really didn't see that take off until we launched the native governance token for Secret Swap, which is itself a secret token, itself a privacy preserving token on Secret Network. That's called CFI, short for Secret Finance. It went live at the end of March. And in the last three months, we've seen LPs show up to uh, provide liquidity for a bunch of different pairs on Secret Swap. Primarily, some of like the largest pairs would be um, ETH versus WBTC, uh, Secret ETH versus Secret Secret, Secret Secret versus Secret USDT. Now, finally, though, the most recent innovation is we're finally realizing that multi-chain narrative. We just launched our mainnet bridge to Binance Smart Chain. So now people can also bridge in their BSC assets as secret tokens. And so now we have some more interesting whoa, 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 cross- whoa, whoa. Hold on, hold on. You just, wait, you, you bridged to Binance Smart Chain? Yes, sir. When did this happen? Last week. You got to read my blog. What? I, dude, <laughs> I know it's it's, it's 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 hardly it's hardly alpha at this point. Uh, I know, I, I, I know. <laughs> no, no, no. But but it's good that we're bringing it up now because yes, this happened just last week. Finally on mainnet, we support twenty different BSC assets. But what this means right. is, yeah, the most interesting pool right now, and we're going to probably see more of these, are cross-chain IL minimized anonymity mining pools. So you can have secret ETH representing ETH from the ETH chain. You can have yeah. secret ETH representing ETH from the Binance chain. They can Whoa. sit in a pool against each other. You can be LPing for CFI rewards by just having your ETH against ETH across chains. And what this is enabling is for people to effectively move their ETH across chains via secret while being able to also take advantage of the AMMs in our ecosystem and any other secret DeFi apps that get built. So we finally have realized our dream of not just cross-chain uh, liquidity, but cross-chain private liquidity. Uh, and then we have a number of other bridges in, in development and on testnet. But since you asked what happened so far this year, I won't even bore you with the testnet really details like until we get secrets? there. Come on, that, what do you mean? We'll get there, we'll get there. We'll get there. This, <laughs> this is an overview. Don't you want people to watch the second half of your shows, Tarek? God, fine, fine. Uh, wait, okay, so so hold on a second now. Um, okay, so let me get this right. Like, I mean, this sounds pretty impressive. I mean, how are liquidity providers getting awareness? And then, and then what are you seeing in the trends in LPs participating in these particular pools? Like, I mean, you know, secret ETH versus Binance ETH, um, that's very new to me. I mean, what are folks telling you, you know, is really driving demand for these types of, of pools? So there's there's something happening. I, I, I'll be honest, I did refresh coin market cap in the last couple of weeks. So <laughs> I'll, I'll start by saying that I find DeFi capital to be extremely mercenary. And in bull markets, when it's just a yield hunt, people are very mercenary with their capital. They're just trying to find, they don't necessarily care about sustainable yield so much as they care about yield at any cost. And in bear markets or those kind of like leaner times, what I'm finding is people do have a preference for these sort of IL minimized pools, um, uh, impermanent loss for anybody who's not following that part of it. But yeah, uh, ETH versus ETH across chains is an IL risk minimized pool because in theory, these things, you know, should just trade one to one with each other minus the fees right. from actually arbing it out across chains. But it's the same reason you see stable coin pools get so much adoption, but those stable coins are on the same network. We can also have, for example, secret USDT 
from Binance trading against secret USDT from ETH as a liquidity pool on secret network. And we're, that was actually the number one most requested pool after these initial reward pools went live. The three initial reward pools uh, for BSC assets were the ones that were most heavily demanded. So that was the ETH, ETH pool that I mentioned. But we also, I believe the two that were ultimately selected were secret versus BNB and secret versus wrapped polka dot, like the, the BEP version of polka dot itself and dot. Now we have a separate bridge in development to the polka dot ecosystem, but before that's live, there's already been a lot of demand. I mean, there was, to be perfectly honest, there was also a lot of demand for a ripple pool for like the BEP 20 ripple asset that that one didn't make the cut this time. Um, but there's all kinds of different uh, demand from LPs in our ecosystem. I would say in the lean times, people seem to be a little less aggressive in yield hunting. Right. They want the, the least risky pools, even if it means mm -hmm. lower returns. And you see right. DeFi yields compressing across all ecosystems, not just ETH, not just Cosmos, but sort of everywhere in the downturns. And then it's like a risk on risk off, like microcosm of the macro environment. Right now it's been risk off, but we might be going back to a risk on environment very shortly. It really depends how sentiment turns. It depends how Bitcoin and ETH lead the market. I would say that that sentiment, even if it starts in the ETH ecosystem, goes everywhere. And that really benefits cross-chain liquidity ideals like what, what we're trying to do, what Osmosis is trying to do, what ThorChain is trying to do. I, I think my prediction would be, we didn't quite get to predictions, but my prediction would be we had this big compression in yields. We had this extraction of capital. This time, with this new DeFi summer, I expect to see people really lean into these multi-chain opportunities, multi-chain yield, because yields were better and people just didn't know. And we needed this kind of massive shock to make people reassess how they were providing liquidity off across all these different chains. And when things got lean, they decided to research cross-chain liquidity more because they were in a hunt for yield. Even if the yields at the time didn't turn out to be better, now they're aware that multi-chain opportunities, multi-chain LP is going to be a massive opportunity in the future. Uh, and when liquidity rushes back in, there's no, there's nothing that says it has to rush back into the places it used to be. It can absolutely Perfect. go to the most innovative platforms and the places where they're going to find the most yield. And so that's my that's my prediction. That's always been our yeah. thesis, but I definitely yeah. think that benefits the Cosmos vision overall. Yep. Saki, what do you think? So I think there's a, a bunch of things that are like uh, 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 subtle here, right? Which is um, one, like essentially what uh, uh, what Tor is describing as is providing liquidity on the same asset over multiple trust paths um, is a is a is a pretty nice can be a pretty nice yield generating opportunity um, because it allows people to um, to sort of un like to change what trust path that they're relying on so they they're willing to pay for that service uh, that's a service that people are willing to pay for uh, we've been seeing that across. We've been seeing uh, on the uh, uh, Ethereum ecosystem where you have like Ren BTC and uh, and uh, wrap, and like Wrapped BTC. These are basically different trust paths. But now, as we kind of go to this, like we as we have like really, I mean, this is we are in DeFi Summer Multi Chain Edition, like Interchain Edition. This is without a doubt the theme of DeFi Summer. Um, DeFi Summer 1.0 was all about ETH. Uh, DeFi two is summary is all about L2s uh, on like Ethereum L2s, Solana, you know, a Cosmos IBC, uh, 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 and more and more and more. Um, and so uh, this sort of opportunity of, of trying to consolidate major trust paths, essentially uh, exchange across major trade routes, this is like big opportunity uh, for being a liquidity provider because you're not exposed, to, there's no... Uh, uh, you don't have the impermanent loss risk of uh, of, uh, of of uh, of essentially being where you're selling your best performing asset for your worst performing asset, um, uh, and so you know it's, this is a, the, it, these this is an exciting aspect of the emerging interchain, and it's really fascinating to see all of this come together. Um, have you guys been thinking anything about you know? offering sort of this like you know the same relationship like from us from, from the point of view of something like secret network um binance smart chain and like something like arbitrum and optimism are like the same thing um are you guys thinking about them in sort of similar ways 
Right. From our perspective, every every chain uh, kind of ends up looking that way. And and what we prioritize is TVL and the, the, the amount of value of assets secured across these chains. And we also have to take into account the velocity of the assets across these chains. It's most interesting to work with the chains that not only secure a lot of different assets in large quantities, but like where people tend to use them as productive assets already. Um, so one of the other chains, for example, that we're exploring right now that we haven't announced is on testnet and haven't announced is on mainnet, but is we had a team build in a hackathon and that we found interesting was to Polygon, obviously, uh, because they've gotten Ave to move a lot of their activity there. Uh, so, so keeping an eye kind of on how all these things work, there's also nothing that says that all of the bridges in our ecosystem need to have the same trust model. Uh, we also, because we have an independent development team that's creating a bridge to Monero, for example, and the demands for the trust model on a Monero bridge are different, let's say, from a trust model that might be acceptable to users of Binance Smart Chain, where they've got a fairly centralized validator model. Uh, so that what we care about is just making sure things can get into the secret ecosystem so that they can have the same privacy benefits and guarantees as everything else. And then it's also to just maximize the value and opportunities for that capital once it's there and maximize the flexibility for users of Secret Network to be able to exchange those types of assets for each other or use them in other productive ways. That's awesome. Uh, one of the things that has inspired a question for me then is, you know, you talk about, um, you know, uh, liquidity providers being mercenary. Now that they're lean, they have sharpened their fangs. Uh, does that mean that, and, and so, you know, and we're seeing new paths to liquidity provisioning coming up. Um, last night, I spent some time on Osmosis, um, which was amazing. Uh, you know, what's your thought on these new AMMs in the Cosmos space, such as Osmosis, Autogravity Dex, and their relationship to Secret? What's, what's the plan there? Right. Uh, I will confess that because we've been so heads down on the secret DeFi ecosystem, I haven't spent nearly as much time as I would like getting hands on with things like Osmosis, where by all accounts, like the launch was amazing. There's There's been a lot of community support. Um, th there's so many cool things about that model that I would love to learn from in terms of like actual like user engagement and acquisition. I think a very underrated metric in the crypto space is active users. And a very overrated metric might be TVL in the short term. Uh, as we've seen, like if we say that capital is mercenary and it's controlled by three mercenaries, uh, the larger the mercenary, the more mercenary it tends to be. So I think that users and providing a delightful user experience and retaining them on the platform, either by providing like amazing liquidity or an amazing actual trading experience, good yields or, or just like good design, like all of that matters to user acquisition and retention. And by all accounts, right. what I've heard about a lot of these new AMMs in the Cosmos ecosystem is that they've done a phenomenal job optimizing for that point. So I really believe that as we try to get users into the Cosmos ecosystem, they're discovering a lot of things that are going to provide unique and best in class user experiences. That's super valuable. Beyond that, obviously, the most important innovation that's coming out of a lot of these things is it's all enabled by IBC. And IBC has been a huge priority for Secret Network and our ecosystem. It's a little more complex for us having Cosmosm contracts integrated, running with enclaves on the network. Like there's some things that make it more challenging as an integration as opposed to just sort of like a trivial point. But we're trying to move quickly to upgrades. Like I know a lot of the other more complex chains are doing. I know Terra is trying to make the same upgrade. And hopefully when we have IBC integrated as well, we'll be able to take advantage of the awesome work that's being done uh, with these cross-chain AMMs in the Cosmos ecosystem uh, by having Secret participating in those ecosystems as an asset, like right. having Secret available in Osmosis. But ideally, yeah. we're also able to bring then all of these assets into our network as Secret mm -hmm. versions of themselves. And the right. more types of assets all these different Cosmos chains end up supporting, I think it's really interesting to do a lot of that work, a lot of that liquidity provisioning in the secret DeFi ecosystem where we can provide these cross-chain yields, but also sort of this cross-chain privacy that comes from being able to easily transact across chains via secret swap or via any of the other AMMs that might launch in our ecosystem. It's, it's just a different model. I'm just really excited about 
the degree of experimentation in the Cosmos space right now and the right. amount of focus that's been placed ultimately on the user experience, because that I think is a maybe an even larger differentiator ultimately than IBC. Right. right. Though both I, mean, I think are I am, I've I'm like I've been, let's say, pleasantly surprised, proud and impressed at like the 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 IBC user experience that the Osmosis team um, has put together. Uh, it's not perfect. Uh, uh, like we, have, there's a lot of scope for improvement, uh, and the entire Cosmos community has to work together. But you know, the Cosmos community has worked pretty worked together pretty well. Uh, like you know, uh, and like to say that the Osmosis launch, you know, the Osmosis team like has done all the heavy lifting. But they also sort of organized and invited and 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 got the collaboration of lots of other people uh, in the cosmos from you know informal who wrote the who 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 you know from the teams writing uh, relayers who are who are running their who are running relayers uh, collaboration from the you know all the chains that launched the initial you know they're helping the initial set of assets and bootstrapping liquidity uh, it's just really been it's been like this whole thing has been like a a cosmos community sort of uh, 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 gathering point. Yep. Um, and I think as every new chain sort of adopts IBC, especially now, I mean, the, and the advantage of not going first, right, is like a bunch of things about the IBC user experience are like already, like that were not known last week are now like firmly established. Right. Like, right. like what is the process of establishing canonical channels on IBC uh, is now like, is now a defined workflow. Whereas like last week it was like speculatively, like we should probably do it this way. Um, um, <laughs> yeah. And, and we don't, we don't mind. <laughs> a, a really, really, really excited. You know, so, you know, the IBC, the IBC, the IBC roads have been, uh, uh, have been, you know, the, the cow pats have been, have been sort of established this week. And so, so it's an exciting time to come on. And I, 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 I've always been a believer that basically, um, you know, Every chain in the cosmos will have a dex. Um, that a dex is not like a specialized functions. There are then things you can do, like Osmosis has done and Secret is doing, where you have built your a lot of your crypto economics around specifically around the dex. Um, it sort of provides a lot of additional, you know, your tokenomics right. are built around the dex. Uh, builds a lot, provides a lot of additional power. It's um, just, it's just good sense, right? Because yeah. everything else on the network is enabled by having a lot of available liquidity for whatever application there would be. You know, NFTs is something that's being explored a lot across the ecosystem now. And I know in the Cosmos ecosystem as well, you know, the Pylons teams and other teams and where, where the liquidity is and where it can flow directs a lot of where people are going to create valuable assets. And if there's assets that represent real world value uh, or real world assets or real world cash flows, you want those to exist where the liquidity is already present on chain. It's 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 just good sense. So having more DEXs, more AMMs, more liquidity uh, is definitely a public good in the Cosmos ecosystem. Is it a differentiator? Longer term, no, but I think it is a need to have if you are going to have other successful applications that leverage whatever is unique about your chain or your ecosystem or your integrations. And seeing this success for some of the very first like IBC enabled AMMs should give everybody in the Cosmos ecosystem confidence that this technical direction is valuable and hopefully also sustainable. Um, early success, I, I should always include my financial disclosures, right? Like present present performance is not indicative of future performance. Um, but I think that we're, we're definitely supposed to gain confidence from everything that we've seen to date with IBC, an um, unbelievably Herculean technical task that by all accounts has been integrated seamlessly into a number of user focused products almost immediately with, uh, with great success and few disruptions and whoever does it next will learn from everything that's come before it and be even better. Correct. And and just for the folks that are listening who are pure liquidity providers but may not be blockchain engineers, what uh, let's define <laughs> as we say this is IBC go to market. Will will you both please tell us what is IBC? IBC I, I, I should uh, take this. Um, please, IBC please, is okay. the protocol <laughs> by which uh, uh, sort of modern fast finality proof of stake blockchains um, 
can uh, seamlessly exchange uh, information with each other, um, sort of at the native protocol level. Um, so it's not relying on a smart contract or a bridge or a reware. Um, it is a it is a native incorporation of 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 essentially like of a light client for other blockchains um, that can pass messages uh, uh, in between blockchains and has been sort of kind of the vision of Tenderman and Cosmos going back all the way to 2014 and you know as of this week finally realized. Okay, that was an awesome definition, Zaki. I am going to now uh, ask it again for liquidity providers who only know that they have money and looking for yield. What does IBC mean? I think you should still take that one. All right, <laughs> Zaki, <laughs> go for it. What IBC means for liquidity providers is there are going to be uh, so. All I will say is, is that, or the way I'll, t I'll, I'll tell the story is that there have been, um, you know, me, you know, there are hundreds of assets that are being, that are, you know, there are dozen, there are more than a dozen assets built with the Cosmos SDK on mainnet. There are uh, hundreds of assets coming. Um, up until now, their only source of liquidity was getting centralized exchanges to list them or bridges like, uh, like uh, Secret Bridge. Um, and now you have the emergence of IBC DEXs like uh, Osmosis, which is launching uh, a very attractive liquidity mining uh, campaign today. Um, and that any IBC connected assets, and right now there are seven IBC connected assets, um, uh, you can be a liquidity provider and you can farm those assets uh, on Osmosis uh, as of today. Got it. So, so now liquidity providers have more blockchains that they can then search and find yield from absolutely uh, okay. i think got this it, is this it. is this is the big this is this is going to be the this is the big thing of DeFi summer 2.0 interchain edition is got it yield yeah. is no longer on one blockchain yield is on every blockchain but isn't it uh, amazing like you can go and you can be a liquidity provider on like an osmosis or like a secret swap and then you can go into these blockchain specific ecosystems and find even more yield like yep. once you are once you start as an LP across like two assets that you might previously had not held, and these are productive assets in their own ecosystem. Not only are you a productive LP on some of these cross chain AMMs, but you're going into these blockchain specific DeFi universes or or lending universes, and you're finding these other opportunities. So just by starting on these cross chain AMMs, you're unlocking all of these different yield opportunities across all manners of different platforms on all of these different. Uh, on all of these different blockchains. It's it's funny, it's just, honestly, I think the only blocker sometimes to liquidity, and maybe this is something to talk about, the only blocker to liquidity on the one hand is awareness, awareness of the opportunities and standing out in a DeFi space that's really dominated by like ETH-focused newsletters where they are discussing at best with some of these L2 solutions, but not some of these multi-chain opportunities. Or... The, the issue is just on ramps, that it's just so easy to start with ETH and kind of splinter from there, be, given all of the on ramps to ETH. But for a lot of these different like Cosmos based assets, because it's not as trivial of an integration for say a centralized exchange, we find it harder to see people getting their very first Cosmos asset or getting their very first multi-chain asset, which is why these interchain bridges to ETH and so on are so important. Like, do, do you think that the blocker is more like liquidity on ramps for multi-chain DeFi, or do you think it's just awareness of the opportunity, or are they linked? So I think on ramps are a huge, are are like, like, I mean the 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 you know part of the the the, the vision of IBC is, um, you know why you know what what has been the long game that we've been playing with with Adam right was we wanted to launch early because we knew that like so many chains were coming. Um, that like the faster we got launched, the you know, and getting getting exchange liquidity and all of that stuff was a real priority because you understand like once you have you know, one as as more and more, on, like so you get a bunch of on ramps. So like Adam can be an on ramp, ETH can be an on ramp, stable coins can be an on ramp, Luna and like the Terra ecosystem can be an on ramp. You get a bunch of successful multi chain. Uh, on ramps, kind of living and breathing. Then everything else over IBC, uh, over bridges, 
can bootstrap off of that. So you get this like second order effect. The other thing I was going to say though, and like one of the reasons why I think the multi-chain era of yield farming is pretty, is so exciting is yield farming is sustainable when what it is doing is like bootstrapping an institution. Um, uh, you know, the, the farms that like, you know, have their, you know, high APY moments and then, you know, every, it, and it's basically, you know, a rug pull or, uh, or, you know, the uh, disappointment for whoever ends up holding bags um, is, is it are like when you don't get an institution. And like, so, you know, and in many ways, the institutions on ETH are somewhat built out right now. Um, the, uh, uh, on the other hand, like the institutions of the interchain and the multi-chain world are like just getting started. Um, and so there's gonna be lots of opportunities for sustainable yield. Awesome. All right. Well, uh, we're up on time. I'm going to jump into the audience and see if there have any questions. Um, we have one on Periscope from Infamous Nell. Can secret SNIP 20 tokens be listed via exchanges? If so, would this lower privacy if implemented? Tor. I'm assuming centralized exchanges in this question. Um, cause it's, why don't you do both? <laughs> well, so, so snip twenties, as we call them, uh, are, are like our equivalent to the ERC 20 standards. So they're like ERC twenties are on Ethereum, except for us, of course, their privacy by default tokens, meaning interactions with the token contract are encrypted viewable only by the user who's interacting with the contract. Um, so right now that's what secret swap and all of secret DeFi relies upon. Uh, that's where, that's what you're using. You're using secret tokens. If you're a liquidity provider on secret swap, you have a secret version of ETH. You're trading it against the secret version of USDT, something like that. That's, that's how the, the whole secret DeFi ecosystem functions. So any AMM in the secret ecosystem, for example, is going to support SNP 20s. Uh, this question gets really interesting for assets that are native to the secret ecosystem. What I would say it, and what we've been seeing is that for asset, for example, Sienna is a protocol that's building in the secret ecosystem. They're, they're building another uh, secret based AMM and also a uh, lending protocol on secret network. They have a native token on secret network. It is called Sienna. They also have a wrapped version of Sienna that lives on Ethereum as an ERC 20. And that token is available on uh, at least one centralized exchange, likely soon to be two. So that's usually how exchanges will do integrations. They'll integrate the Ethereum asset. You'll, you'll be able to then trade for the Ethereum asset, and then you can bridge it back to secret network to use it on mainnet or use it in governance purposes. For centralized exchanges to integrate privacy preserving tokens, uh, that's probably a little bit more of a headache for them, but it's also a little bit of more of a headache for us if we're trying to position for this sort of like privacy first multi-chain world. Like the goal is not to have centralized exchanges list a bunch of secret native assets. The goal is to drive liquidity into the secret ecosystem and having all of the value be in using those assets as productive assets in the secret ecosystem. So we don't want to limit availability, meaning we would love for them, you know, to be listed their ERC 20 version or whatever other version on a centralized exchange. But ultimately, they, they live on secret network and they derive all their value from the privacy preserving properties that they keep on secret network. Once you deposit them as privacy tokens to an exchange, not only are you giving up custody to the exchange, you're also giving up all of your privacy to the exchange and you're giving up all of the utility of the token uh, that you would be getting otherwise on the exchange. I, I hope that's an answer to the question. It's mostly me saying I, I would prefer to see these assets stay in the secret ecosystem and, and be productive. But via bridges, we can still have centralized exchange liquidity for secret-based assets. Um, and I think the future is assets that just sort of live on every blockchain anyway. We just want them to be productive in our world. Excellent. Thank you. All right, question for Zucky. Uh, how does Secret and Sommelier collaborate with sellers? How does Secret and Sommelier collaborate with sellers? Uh, I don't think we figured out the answers to any of these questions yet, um, but um, there is a there is definitely a role for privacy in sellers um, that needs to be figured out, um, and so that seems like an area where we, collaboration could occur. Awesome! All right, great. Okay, so let me just check in with Mario. Any more questions, Mario? Is that good for 
questions for today. I think that might be it. I know we're well over time. All right. And so, uh, Tor, before we go, any secret alpha uh, to, to send us off that uh, folks listening should also, <laughs> who have waited this long as well, uh, might be interested in yeah. to participate on Secret Network? Uh, if you like Cosmo-based Cosmos based DeFi, you might want to be watching our Twitter in like 20 minutes. All right. All right. Very excited. Make sure to watch. <laughs> that is very cool. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be there. Uh, I think uh, we're good to go. Thanks, Mario, for the confirm. Uh, thank you, everybody, for joining. Uh, thank you, Tor, for jumping on and giving us uh, one of our very best and well-attended uh, Somalia LP AMAs. Thank you, Zaki. Awesome questions, awesome insights into IBC and the future of the multi-chain world. And uh, Tor, like you said, uh, it's lean time, so LPs need to be aggressive with their liquidity. Uh, they should definitely pursue secret and pursue Somalia to make sure they can maximize those yields. Thank you, guys. Have a great week. Indeed. So see you again.